Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Harnessing Innovation to Rethink Your Ambulatory Care Environment. I'm Nicholas Bilas, the President for Healthcare Leaders in New York, and we are honored today to be co-hosting with the New York chapter of HIMSS. Even more so, I'm thrilled to have the New York HIMSS chapter president, Nick Cristiano, moderating today. Nick and I connected a few months ago as we realized there was tremendous value in collaborating, especially since our organizational mission is so much aligned in that we are both unwaveringly passionate about the promotion of healthcare leadership, undoubtedly in a time when technology and innovation are both at their peak. The ability to come together in this way is truly amazing, laying a further foundation and creating an engaging environment for you all to share ideas, learn, and grow. I'm excited to see such an amazing turnout today of over 200 registered members listening live. I can tell you with confidence that the next couple of weeks and months are looking exciting. We're happy to announce HLNY is offering new digital content and webinars to engage with our members. We invite all those listening today, including HIMSS members, to take part of that. A special thank you also to Anthony Ferrante as well, the New York HIMSS president-elect, also on today, who will provide more detail about upcoming HIMSS activities and some of their innovative offerings later on. I leave you with one last remark, which is that I hope you all walk away intrinsically inspired this afternoon and beyond to take hold of your current situation, which to many of us feels daunting, I'm sure. But continue to push forward in innovation as there's no better time. In our discussion today, I foresee us quickly appreciating that technology for technology's sake is a mistake. Automating bad processes is still results in bad processes, which is why strong leaders like yourself are needed to identify and solve problems early on. I'm looking forward to our moderator and panelists today sharing what they have fundamentally learned as they continue to innovate in the right direction. Let's get right into it, and I'll hand it over to our moderator, Nick Cristiano. All right, thank you. So, so why don't we get started? So I want to thank everyone and thank you, Nick, for making that introduction. We appreciate it. We have the ability to collaborate with fellow healthcare-oriented chapters. We have three panelists today. We're going to do something a little bit different than what is typical uh, of these presentations. We're actually going to have an open debate. We're going to pose questions to our panelists and have them present uh, their points of view. Uh, we're looking for interactive dialogue. We're looking for you to uh, uh, create questions uh, through the chat session so we can address them as, as well. Uh, we're going to kick off with our, our three others, uh, giving a little uh, introduction on themselves and um, their background. I'm Nick Cristiano. I'm the current president of the New York State Chapter. I'm also the uh, CEO of Aris Radiology, which is a teleradiology firm. Uh, in business, uh, more years than I care to think, but uh, healthcare is definitely a passion. So at this point, uh, in the order of... Um, uh, alphabetical order, we'll ask Mary Ellen, uh, and then Stephen, and then uh, Jen. Just give a quick uh, background on yourself and your organization so the audience has a point of orientation uh, as to uh, where your thoughts may, could be coming from. So Mary Ellen, why don't we start with you? Thank you, Nick. So happy to be here this afternoon. So by way of background, I'm a nurse for many, many years. I started off on the hospital side, went to hospital administration, worked on the hospital admin side, and had the great opportunity while I was there to be part of three people that formed Fidelis Care New York. So we created a managed care company in the city of New York way back in time. And we always said if we knew then what we know now, we probably wouldn't have done it, but we learned a lot. So I went on to have a very long career in managed care. Um, obviously, Fidelis was a great opportunity taking it statewide, learning all the ins and outs. Then moving on to places like GHI and Emblem Health, uh, one of the most intriguing experiences of all was with Oscar Insurance, where I had the opportunity to start up as one of the people who helped stand that company up, but learn about tech from worlds other than healthcare and how it could really support what we wanted to do. Um, along the way, I did a, a turn back to visiting Nurse Service of New York, went back to my roots as a nurse and provider side, and then most recently wound up at Village Care New York, where it was a great opportunity to work with a managed long-term care plan. I had the good fortune to retire at the end of 19, and since then, um, again, based on my interest in Oscar, 
I support a lot of healthcare tech companies that are emerging. So working with them on their business model, how to move forward. Um, obviously, these are groups that have gone well into the funding rounds and are doing really well. And there is such excitement on that horizon. So the point of view I want to bring to the conversation today is, even though I understand hospitals and ambulatory care, I understand the managed care payer side, I really want to talk about innovation on the health tech provider's side, which is really inspiring. So thank you, Nick. Let me hand back to you. All right. Thank you very much, Mary Ellen. All right. Jen, if you don't mind, could you uh, introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer Toda. I'm one of the senior directors at Memorial Sloan Kettering overseeing our outpatient operations here. Um, I've been with MSK for about 23 years, working in frontline operations uh, and then working my way up to a leadership role. I've overseed, I oversee day-to-day -day operations for many of our outpatient facilities. Uh, mainly in New York City, and um, much of my focus has been I'm in not, opening not, new facilities, this. deploying technology, as well as, um, in particular, outpatient practice and infusion operations. And uh, I'm honored to be here so as well, uh, to be partnering with it's my colleagues, Muriel and Stephen, as well. That's good. Thank That's you, a good everybody. Sign. Stephen Garai so, here. I'm currently the Vice President of Information Technology in the Enterprise CIO for WMC Health in the Hudson Valley area. Um, have over 25 years of healthcare IT experience. So I'd love to share my perspective specifically related to ambulatory care and everything we went through the COVID and how this is impacting the uh, new normal. So I'm glad to be here. All right. All right, we're gonna get right into the questions. So the first question for the panel, and I'm gonna open it up. Whoever feels uh, the most passionate about the response can go first. Four months ago, rethinking our ambulatory care environment might have meant something completely different than it did with the advent of COVID-19. Necessity may be the mother of invention, but COVID-19 became the architect of the new norm. How has the current crisis impacted the plans you had in place for the ambulatory environment? Nick, this is Steve. I'll take that. Um, okay. uh, is in, uh, with digital transformation, as we're looking at digital transformation, across the continuum as our patient needs are changing, as they're looking for lower cost, best quality, and highest level of convenience, the move to consumerism in healthcare has been growing tremendously. And I think the impact of COVID-19 just enhances that. As with everything in every organization that tries to go through change and advance and move into a digital world, the ability to change and drive change throughout the organization, it's a really hard thing to do. And as Harvard professor John Cotter said, if you don't have a burning platform, you create one. I think COVID-19 is our burning platform and an opportunity for us to really drive digital innovation to help the organization drive change in the way care is uh, delivered to our organization. There are many, many things that can be done uh, with technology, but I think technology, as a CIO, we need to partner with the operational leaders and clinical leaders to make sure that we're strategically approaching this, not in a reactionary mode. As we're coming out of COVID and there's so much pent up demand for care, care that was put on hold, uh, care that was elective and necessary that really was not done during the COVID crisis, there's a pent up demand and we must be prepared and ready to go when everything is starting to open back up. As in the Hudson Valley here, things are starting to open back up and we're doing a great job of reacting to things and getting things back in place. But we must think strategically, how can we use this event to really transform uh, care delivery to our patients? I'd like to add to that. This is Mary Ellen. I think COVID changed the entire landscape for ambulatory care and what it could be. In the venture capital care startup space, one of the companies I serve on the board for is Eden Health. They're an amazing company. So they really introduced the employer aspect into this. So not only was the primary physician in a relationship with their patient, but now the employer entered because employees were now distributed across sometimes three states. Employees were calling the employer, when can we come back to work? Employers had a lot of questions about how can we come back to work? All the offices were closed. How do you manage that? And Eden, I think in a brilliant move, leveraged all their virtual care capacity to reach out to employees across state lines and work with employers to make testing available. To actually, we talked about things like setting up our own drive-through at a local CVS, working with Quest and LabCorp, Quest in particular, 
on home testing. Employers didn't want the old nasopharyngeal testing. They wanted saliva testing because that's what their employees were telling them. How did we uh, work with employers to look at under what conditions could those employees return to work? Were we doing mass temperature testing? There was a whole lot of interest by companies with 30,000 employees. On one weekend, we drop ship 30,000 home testing kits to employees who couldn't get to their usual doctor. It changed the whole equation and connected the patient, the physician, and even the employer in very different ways. And I think the age of virtual is here to stay. Once these people got used to communicating through text, talking to their doctor via the phone, odd hours that really accommodated family situations, you know, obviously e-prescription into the pharmacy without a doubt, but it's changing the landscape forever. And brick and mortar needs to really look at what are the virtual options and how much they're being adopted by patients in the age of COVID. How do you manage normal care when brick and mortar is not possible and how much of this will last well into the next gen of AmCare? I would add to what both Mary Ellen M and Stephen have said that you know, in some um, in some avenues of healthcare, I think the brick and mortar there has to still be a brick and mortar presence. For instance, uh, procedures, you know, uh, some infusional therapies, et cetera. But I think, um, like Mary Ellen said, the, the age of tech is here to stay, and um, and we need to be able to be nimble between tech in the brick and mortar and tech um, in the patient and the physician and the care provider's home. I will add, though, although COVID sort of forced us to to get there. I think we could not have done it so swiftly as an industry if we didn't have some of the relaxing of the regulatory guidelines that we had been up against in the past. You know, for instance, licensing across state lines and, uh, you know, uh, let's say a New York physician having a televisit with a New Jersey patient couldn't happen so easily from a reimbursement perspective prior to COVID. Um, and now we're seeing, you know, that. that one example of how the regulatory bodies have really worked with us in this crisis. And I think that was key to moving things along. Um, being such a regulated industry, I, I think that's one avenue that we really have to sort of stay connected to um, in terms of continuing to perpetuate uh, the digital revolution, if you will, in healthcare. Uh, Jennifer, I completely agree with you, Mr. Steve, but there is a push. I just saw a recent CHIME survey that really said about uh, they surveyed 200 uh, digital health leaders across the enterprise across the country and people were more concerned about you know enhanced reimbursement for telehealth and all digital care and enhanced reimbursement for home health monitoring i think it's critical yeah. for us to help the organizations like chime and others push the uh folks in washington to make sure that the regulations are keep adjusting and we're, you know, in uh, reimbursements and all the rules are, are changing as we're trying to change and be adaptive to our patients as well. This is Mary Ellen. I couldn't agree more. Reimbursement has to absolutely lighten up. In a commercial insurance environment, an employer can pay for some of these things over and above a typical benefit package. But when you look at government programs, regulations have to come up to speed with what commercial employers can pay for. The other piece I think we need to look at for regulation, as Jennifer is 100% right, is medical records sharing of information. So when COVID hit and people went to go to their normal doctor in their community and found the doctor's office was closed, they were calling into virtual care doctors, but without the benefit of the history. So looking at how to share medical records in an ambulatory environment across settings, I think is another thing we strongly have to look at. And how can we leverage a group? In New York, we have HealthX. I think they're an amazing organization that would step up to work with us. But how do we begin to work? I know HealthX planned and did great work around Hurricane Sandy. This pandemic thing provides a great setting for us to figure out how do we apply the lessons learned from Sandy in a setting. So yes, a lot of regulatory reform needed to make this loosen up and work better. All right. So going going back, and I, I think it's great dialogue. We basically have pierced the veil. We've broken the glass. Uh, we've made changes 
because of, of this emergency situation. How do we prevent it from going back to the way it was? I attended a conference yesterday where they talked about the post-COVID world. And I said, there is no post-COVID world. COVID is now part of your world and will continue to be so. So how has it impacted uh, or maybe how should it impact our plans? What does it mean for healthcare in the home? And this goes into the telehealth spaces as well. How do we manage this? Because as many of us feel, this is not going to what, going to go away. We should not let the regulations bounce back, snap back, and, and put us into a situation uh, that the current circumstances uh, just don't allow. So Mary Ellen, you look like you're ready to respond. So I'm gonna ask you first. You know, I think back to my times as an ICU nurse way back when, ancient days, you had every monitor around you giving you data all the time about the condition of your patient, and you could react to the data stream. But when you have a patient in the home environment, there is nothing online in that home. So I think a real opportunity for us as we extend forward with telehealth is there are some traditional bulky telehealth things like you put a blood pressure machine in the home and a nurse is calling you. There are a lot of wearables, things that you can buy on Amazon through Apple iTunes store that people are beginning to use. And we have to look at bringing the home online. How do we put the kind of technology into a home that can bring us streaming information without the high cost workers in the home to manage the equipment? I think this is a great opportunity for us. You know, Cardia Mobile is something that comes to mind. There's lots of really cool things we can do, but there's very much um, a veil across the patient in the home. Talking about piercing that veil, we have to use technology to make that work better. Absolutely, um, I agree totally too. agree, Mary Ellen. And I think the other thing we have to consider is um, the the services that patients need to support their care that can't be done by a machine yet. I guess anyway. For instance, blood draws or EKGs, or theoretically, maybe your phone can do an EKG, but I understand the jury's out on how accurate it is. But blood draw comes to mind, I mean, specifically working in the oncology space, you know, to do a telemedicine visit with an oncology patient and then tell them to go to a brick and mortar for blood work just seems so counterproductive. Um, and, you know, and I think in the age of consumerism, Patients are looking for an experience similar to that of, you know, of the other experiences in their life, like retail and dining. And um, so I do think it, we would be remiss to let this opportunity go by and not consider, um, you know, Nick, I know we were, we were prepping, you had termed these services as sort of road warrior healthcare services. And, uh, you know, it sounds a little crazy, but I think we have to go there. I really do. Otherwise, it starts to feel like, you know, what's the point of seeing the doctor from your home when you have to travel to do other things prior to that visit or potentially even on the same day as that visit? It doesn't make a lot of sense. The, the two have to work in tandem. So th this is to, to create lasting change and to really drive change. You have to really look at it strategically. You have to look at partnership. You have to be able to deliver care where the care is needed by if you look at a younger consumer, no one wants to come back to the ED even before COVID. And now that they're so afraid of coming into the hospitals, you have to be able to partner with other organizations in their neighborhood. And for example, a blood test or blood work are things that cannot be done in homes. You partner with this, uh, uh, for example, a CVS or Walgreens. You have to look strategically at partnerships and seeing how you can engage the consumers where they want to be engaged. Because as you said, consumerism has been growing before COVID. COVID only enhances it. So as an organization that most ambulatory care providers are really driven by inpatient large hospital systems. So you have to look at it holistically that the inpatient hospital systems really got to be able to drive that change and look beyond their traditional way of delivering care and be able to sustain that care, not just react to COVID and after COVID is done and we get a vaccine in a year, two years, six months, whatever that is. Make sure we use this to really change the way care is delivered and really meet the patients where they, they require the care. Agreed. Uh, I also would say that in addition to, to relationships among um, traditional health organizations and other companies, as you mentioned, 
We also need to be able to share information digitally between each other, which is not easy currently, having had experience doing that or trying, attempting to do that with other organizations. Um, the interfacing and getting information like, you know, order details or reports or notes or a patient's chart out of your institution and into another, you know, another company's hands is not simple. And so, again, I think that's where I think there's a, there's a role for regulatory, but there's definitely a role, um, you know, for the CIOs like yourself, Stephen, and, and others on the tech side to try to make that a little, a little more simple. Completely agree that collaboration has to be among various different health systems. We cannot, we can no longer operate within our own ecosystem. We really got to be right. able to partner with folks like you and Northwell and, and Mounty and everybody within our ecosystem to see how can we leverage what our specialties, what our technologies are to work towards, you know, the betterment of the patient. Uh, absolutely. And sharing information is critical for us to really understand what our needs are, what your needs are. And how do we really be treat the patient when they arrive at whoever door they arrive at? We should be able to collaborate and coordinate together. I think this is an amazing opportunity for us to to reduce cost. We have a lot of high cost systems that bring people together. Maybe we need to recon reconceive of the ambulatory care field as something that feeds from primary care community-based practices into tertiary ambulatory care, where as the level of severity increases, the level of treatment becomes more complex, that there are feeder systems from the community, but that a lot of care does reside in the community. And that community care is not connected to large hospital systems. They operate very much independently in the shadows of big systems. And quite honestly, there's a fear on the part of a lot of community-based providers that their patients will be siphoned off to larger systems. So I absolutely agree with Jennifer, a way to be more transparent and share the information and look at what's bubbling up from the ground up in ambulatory care. And how do we create a coherent system that flows through and gets people to big systems when they most need it? All right, so we have started to slip into patient-centric consumerism. And now with COVID here, and as Stephen indicated earlier, and I think both Jennifer and Mary Ellen did as well, patients are afraid to come to the hospital. Whereas at some point in time, uh, the ER was their main source of, of care, especially, uh, we'll say, primary care. Uh, and now that is no longer the case or it, it cannot be uh, supported. Where's the patient in all of this? I mean, part of changing the model, and I'll go into other areas of healthcare. So if I'm a CVS or if I'm a Walgreens, I have created a consumer-based model where I can have your meds delivered to your home. Not by drone yet, but we're working on that. Uh, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm Amazon, um, I, I do have a, a, pharmaceutical, a pharmaceutical program uh, that I can get your meds to you. Uh, and also your over-the-counter uh, material as well. I have uh, mini clinics where I can just stop in and get this done. And so from a convenience standpoint, from a cost standpoint, uh, reliability, uh, they are reaching out where the traditional providers of care uh, maybe have been caught a little flat-footed. So where do we think we stand with the patient in, in getting them involved in, in this change process because we're in the middle of change? Absolutely. I think it's regaining the trust between that bond between patients and providers. Um, you know, you, you trust your physician, you trust everybody else, and specifically to that younger generation who does not like coming to the hospital, specifically as well to the older generation who are a little less trustworthy of technology. We can speak of the greatest technology, but unless they're willing to adapt and feel safe with the technology in their homes or, you know, uh, as we were doing video visits and all that, it's really working to regain their trust by having protocols and standards to make them feel safer. For example, temperature scanning in, in the community uh, testing. There are a variety of number of things you can do to really enable the, the, the consumer, uh, looking at patients as consumers again, 
to really manage them, use our marketing department really to communicate with them. The hospitals are safe again, but if, they're, if you don't feel comfortable, here's what we have to offer for you. It's a matter of communicating with them, sharing with them how safe they are, what sort of protocols we have in place, either temperature scanning, if testing in the neighborhood, and really engaging them all over again. It's a matter of rebuilding the trust with the community all over again. Um, this is Mary Ellen. I'll, uh, I'll tell you a story about Oscar. When I worked at Oscar, we were on the exchange. We offered Obamacare. And we had a lot of young people that were signing up, people that didn't either have health insurance or didn't bother with it because, quite frankly, they didn't think it was important. If they got sick, they might show up at a doctor for one visit, but they didn't expect to really be sick. So we made a calculated bet, and we offered Teladoc. 24-7, 365, absolutely free. And we said, okay, this could make us or break us. And what we saw is the uptick among young folks opting for a Teladoc service, opting for an immediate call or a text, immediate um, referral to an x-ray if they fell in the basketball court, immediately e-prescribed overwhelmingly the younger groups went for this. And I say this because I think we can't look at this group as an amorphous group that needs uh, primary care. They really are different segments that have to be looked at differently. So as a nurse and running the medical management group at Oscar, we would get the soap notes every day. It would come across in instantaneously. And I put a nurse practitioner in front of a computer screen to say, what were my patients calling Teladoc about? What were my insured calling? Because maybe we could make the offerings better, teach them better. And overwhelmingly, they just had questions. Should I go to the ER? Do you think I broke my arm? Is my baby sick enough? What should I do? And a lot of questions that they never asked their doctor. I think I have an STD, I'm not sure. So I learned very quickly that when you're looking at millennials and the young group who's now marching through the generations, they want rapid, quick, reliable, kind of instantaneous gratification on their primary care needs, which are not super complex needs. So I think what we have to do in the future is really sort out complex needs, moderate needs from these more generic kind of younger needs and look at what the solutions are best for these different groupings. Because once we started that Teladoc, oh my God, it was, it was the uptake was phenomenal. I think 30% of our patients at one point were using Teladoc as a pro, opposed to going to a primary care doctor. But I didn't worry because this was the group that wasn't going to the primary care doctor at all. So it was their version of accessing healthcare in a different way. And it's these, access points that if we focus on, I really think is a key to a strong ambulatory care in the future. So with that in mind, sharing data, getting closer to the patient, and oh, by the way, a lot of telehealth visits, the patient interacts with the physician for a more longer intimate period of time than when, that pa when the patient would go to the primary care's office and would have the allotted seven to 12 minutes uh, while that uh, the physician was interacting with this tablet. We're now getting into the area of we're sharing data, we're sharing information uh, and privacy and control and big brother. You know, where, where do we draw the line? If we go back to what happened with COVID, there were a number of measures that were taken that were, in my mind, proper in, in order to address the uh, emergency. But, but clearly on a different day with a different level of urgency uh, would have been contested in terms of invasions and crossing the line. Where do we draw the line? Where Where is privacy and and uh, uh, confidentiality uh, somewhat compromised in, in terms of giving better care or better, more affordable, affordable and, and personable care? Um, Nick, as a CISO myself, uh, wear multiple hats. That concerns me greatly. As I understood the urgency of the pandemic, and there were a lot of rules that were relaxed, and for, of course, I understood why. And they were, you know, allowed to do many things that were not, were even if you consider those 
three, four months ago would have been blasphemy. So there are ways to go around it, applying various different levels of controls and protocols to make sure that patients' privacy are protected. But I think we need to look at it again and make sure the rules that were uh, uh, re released and, and, and not monitored as much need to go back and monitor and make sure that they're put back in place. There are ways of doing this, but we were under a pandemic and there were a lot of things that were need to be done urgently. And it was a reactive mode, reactionary mode. So I think at some point very in the near future, we need to go back, look at these regulations that were lapped, make sure that privacy uh, is protected. But again, technology can adjust, technology can be adopted, but make sure that it's a secure platform that our data is protected, the patient data is protected, and that everybody's safe. But I, I think we need to seriously look at it again. Yeah, I agree. I, I think um, everything we've been talking about probably still has to be done um, under an umbrella of ensuring privacy. Um, you know, I think we're hearing it in other, you know, in other tech sectors as well. You know, customers really demanding more privacy and, and the various privacy breaches across all industries, not just healthcare, and how devastating they are. But you know, it stands to reason that that a breach in healthcare is probably potentially even worse. And so, whatever we do, we need to make sure that we're still we're still protecting the patient's privacy. But to Stephen's point, I mean, our tech has still has a ways to go, but I think has come you know a long way where we can hopefully we can hopefully achieve that. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to challenge the group because it's I think it's healthy always to challenge the group. So I get emails that basically say, "Hey, your credit rating is great. Here's here's what the opportunities to reduce all your loans, your mortgage." Uh, I get opportunities to say, "Hey, you know, you've owned your car way too long. You need to buy another another one." Uh, I I go to we go to the mall before the the pandemic. Uh, past stores would recognize my cell phone and say. You know what? You can buy your golf balls cheaper here, and somehow I allow that. Uh, but if I have an agency that says, "You know, Nick, you got to lose some more weight, so let's take a few more steps," uh, or "You know what, Nick, that cigar and that brandy was really good, but let me tell you what it's doing to you," uh, I take exception to that. Why, guys? How do we change? Why do we allow one side of the street and not the other? Especially since healthcare costs are probably uh, the highest uh, of, of any one sector going. Nick, this is Mary Ellen. I couldn't agree with you more. 20 years ago, I was at a healthcare conference in DC, and Nick, uh, Newt Gingrich spoke. And he said, Why can I get on a plane and fly to Paris and dip my bank card, and out comes perfectly converted to euros? money from my bank account and I don't lose any money. He said, if I can do that with my money, why can't we do it with healthcare? We have to seriously ask ourselves, what the heck can we do? Point two, there's a lot of generationality in here. You ask a younger person, they're like, yeah, uh, sure. I, I want all this technical, it doesn't bother me. So there's generational issues to be in, involved in this. And the third thing I want to say on the innovation side is one of the groups I'm helping are two guys that I was helping them before they graduated from college. They were still in their final years of college and they're doing blockchain work for healthcare information. And they have major interest from some of the biggest um, investors in tech, how they can store information like medical record information in blockchain. We have to catapult way forward in healthcare and come up with the ways that we can share it. The need is there, we have to move it forward. Agreed. Agreed. I agree with you, but I think the organization itself try to get away or invest as little as possible in technology, not realizing that technology was the key driver to link everything going forward. And not that I'm a CIO, I'm a little biased, but I think COVID has shown you what technology can do to really enhance patient care and the delivery of care. Specifically, it relates to you know delivering care, telehealth, home health visits, uh, patient monitoring. So it has to be a, a renewed interest in investment in technology by these organizations that the tech does exist. As you said, Mary Ellen, there's blockchain, national patient identifier. There's so much out there. 
But as a CIO with limited funds, you have to get commitment from your organization to really invest. I think federal funding should be one, one way of looking at it again. Uh, with meaningful use back in the day, everyone ha now has an EMR, right? It has to be some sort of program that really forces the organization with grants and matching funds to really invest in technology so we can really meet the demands of the changing world. Yeah, and the only other point I would add to all of that is that this is probably another place where we need to explore the patient opinion and, and use this as an opportunity to offer the patient's choice. To Mary Ellen's point, different generations are going to have different feelings about it, and I would say not even just generation, gender, culture, you know, I mean, there's, there's so many angles to it um, that, you know, I think it's time that we engage. Right now, the privacy laws are very sweeping. It's a one-size-fits-all. Maybe that needs to change in the future. Maybe patients should be able to choose. I can choose who can see my profile on a social media platform. Um, you know, I can choose whether I want to save my credit card information every time I go to purchase something. But I don't really have a choice so much uh, in healthcare about how lenient or, or restrictive, you know, I want the privacy uh, laws to be for me. So maybe we have. I think you. Good. I'm sorry. No, I'm saying you have to really treat the patient as a Disney experience in healthcare. Now, focus on the patient, focus on patient engagement, not just on patient satisfaction, but on technology and technology needs. How do you want to be cared for? How can we do it better? What can we do for you to really treat you where you want to be treated and provide the best care for you? So it's more of a getting a, a building that relationship with us, that, that patient as a consumer and really driving care based on their needs, not what the healthcare system thinks really flipping the model in its head and be really patient focused, not just say it, but really live it. Yeah. All right, so maybe we got the wrong people running, running and driving healthcare. Maybe, maybe it's the Amazons of the world. I mean, 15 years ago, Amazon came on the scene and some of us said, we'll never, never buy stuff interactively and I'll always go to the mall. I mean, that's part of my social you know, existence. And 15 years later, malls are closed. The majority of, of the shopping is being done online. Michael Gatto, I think you, you unmuted your phone, so you may want to mute again. Um, and they have figured out how I can purchase anything from anywhere. Uh, I can do it securely. Uh, I can track where it is. My goods show up at my door front, and I get a text message that says it's here. And if I don't like it, I can actually package it back and send it back and get a credit before it's arrived uh, back at the uh, the vendor. So maybe our solution should be coming from Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and others, um, and not the Epics and Cerners and other major vendors that are out there. What do you uh, What do you guys think about that? Do we have the wrong player, or are we now at the the beginnings where some of these major giants will be taking over the delivery of healthcare in terms of the integration, the uh, the security, the convenience, etc. Thoughts? I think COVID. I think Nick, thank you, and a great question. I think we all have to have a the experience that I have on my Amazon app, my favorite app. I'm a Prime member, and I love it. I buy everything from my dog food to my children's toy to my gardening equipment on Amazon. That has to be the healthcare experience. I think COVID-19 has just created a platform for these guys to really drive technology and change healthcare. I think we're just in the precipice of a revolution, and I hope you know the adoption goes quicker than, than than it would take in a traditional healthcare environment. I think folks are more aware of the need. Folks are more will be more adaptable to the new changes that are coming. But I think there is so much technology out there if it's harnessed by the right organization. It, it can de definitely revolutionize the care that Amazon has re uh, revolutionized the uh, shopping experience. Yeah, yeah this... I would agree. Go ahead, Mary Ellen. No, I was going to say I, I absolutely agree. And, you know, for any of you who have had my experience of having a patient discharged from the hospital, but because the oxygen concentrator didn't get there in time, they had to be readmitted. 
that is one readmission that is unforgivable, unacceptable. So one of the companies I'm working with now is Believe Health. The founder is uh, an ex-Oscar friend and went to the West Coast and started up a new age DME kind of company. And they do exactly what you were describing. They use Amazon-like services to intake orders, to process orders, to deliver orders, and give the patient that shopping experience. Your package, your, your oxygen concentrator has been shipped. You can expect delivery on this date. Delivery confirmation, somebody to call up, and they track it right through, and they look at the turnaround times for that Amazon-like experience. The companies that can do this are starting to come at the periphery we have to take note. Believe Health has their Medicare um, number. They were filing for their Medicaid number. But companies like this will revolutionize the old mom and pop DME delivery apparatus where you got to beg somebody to take out bandages or oxygen or something. I agree. Bezos, the Bezos minded solutions are what we have to look at in healthcare. Yeah, I agree too. Um, you know, I would hope that the EHR companies are thinking this way and how great would it be if there was some sort of collaboration between, you know, EHR companies and then the tech industry. Um, but I would also say that, you know, the players that also have to be at the table there are the insurers and, of course, the regulatory bodies, um, which, you know, I Healthcare as an industry, I think, is just more challenged by different regulation and, of course, the insurance companies. But, you know, let's assume the Amazons and Googles and others of the world have gotten over a lot of regulation, a lot of hurdles already. Let's assume healthcare can, too. And what more important than healthcare to get there? Well, we're going to take some questions from, from the uh, audience. Because uh, we've hit that uh, 150 uh, mark, and um, I'm going to paraphrase the, the, the question. Uh, but with telemedicine, are there any concerns, especially in areas that are serving patient populations with low uh, uh, literacy um, or are not comfortable with the technology? Um, is there opportunity or potential for inadvertent uh, health care to be um, applied? Um, is this technology telehealth, does it only work in areas of affluence and, and where there's educational uh, uh, backing? Or do, does it work ubiquitously? Does it work in all areas? Do we think there's some concerns there? Right. I think that the technology will work as long as you have the appropriate bandwidth. And in some rural areas, they may not be the bandwidth to fully realize the value of telehealth. But that's where you have to, as a large ambulatory care uh, offering practice, you have to partner with community-based organizations. As you go back to social determinants of health again, to treating that patient in their community, treating them holistically, and tying telehealth to, to that. Really working with them to make sure they have the proper nutrition, you know, proper care, but also make sure to have enough technology, understand technology, offer advice and training to them. So you're treating the patients as a whole, not just looking at the technology that can drive telehealth, but you're looking at the patients as, as a whole within that community. I would also add that it just has to be simple. Um, you know, we made a quick pivot to telehealth. But, you know, at least in, in our experience, in the experience um, in my organization, it hasn't been as, it hasn't been that simple. Um, it should just always be a click of a link or something real easy without a lot for the patients to have to figure out. I don't think we're there yet. Yeah, I, I would agree with both of my colleagues. Um, I think back on the managed long-term care population. So there are tens of thousands of folks enrolled in a managed long-term care program in New York City alone. And to get into a managed care long-term care program, you have to be nursing home eligible, meaning you could go to the nursing home if you wanted to, you qualify, but instead you choose to live at home in your community in the apartment you grew up in. So it's a beautiful thing. 
but we're talking about people that can't get out of bed in the morning without somebody to help them. So absolutely the human component has to be there. They need the bathing and the cooking and the feeding, but they have to coordinate a lot of care. And usually the aid is the best person they can work with. And if the doctor says, well, come in and see me in the office right now, um, to, for them to collect their oxygen and their wheelchair and their walker and their to get out the door, you get, I'm painting a picture that you get. So I actually looked at, could we put things like an Alexa in the home, where instead of them having to go on a keyboard or reach out, Alexa, call my doctor. I need to speak to somebody. Call my daughter. I think you're right. Simple is the key. And we have to think of the most complexly ill um, group. They, they don't get behind a keyboard. They don't look up a portal. They don't look at any of that stuff. But they need survival information. And I think we have to be ubiquitous and get ourselves into that home and communicating well with the patient and their caregiver, whether it be a relative or some sort of aid, because that's how care gets directed. That's how they access the system. Completely agree with that patient and family engagement. You have to engage the family for these specific patients and work with the family members to really see what's appropriate and what, what's easiest to adapt. Anyone can use an iPhone, but I agree with you. Some folks may not be able to get out of bed. And I, I know of technology that exists that's Alexa-like uh, autonomous monitoring that can react to the patient movement and really deliver care. But again, you have to have a coordinated approach as an ambulatory care uh, provider to really reach out to these patients and see what, what they need on an individual or specific basis to understand that one solution is not going to fit all. You have to tailor your solution based on your population. But I, I agree with everyone that there is a need. The technology does exist, but the, the healthcare providers really have to invest and work collaboratively with different organizations to make it happen. I think we have time for one more question, and it is, have you addressed the Medicare B quality payment program, QPP, post-COVID at all? If yes, how? As you probably know, on the MIPS versus APM side of the QPP, CMS has given a pass on 2019 participation, but for 2020, CMS is still saying all systems go. There's a lot of money at stake for ambulatory care organizations, and the ability to achieve quality goals is hampered by the fact that CMS is not allowing use of telehealth visits for delivering care called by a quality category program. Influenza immunization is a great example of that change. Um, I can take that on. I mean, what you're okay. really talking about is value-based payment. So in the age of COVID, post-COVID, how does the concept of value-based payment change over time? whether you're looking at a regula regulatory set or a commercial insurer set, and how do you bring that forward? So I think one of the themes we've talked about a lot is the consumer input, the client input. You know, where is the client in all of this? So everybody has to get a flu shot. That's the measure, or we're dropping now. But, you know, what if the patient doesn't see that as important to them? We're not asking the patient what's the most important value-based um, opportunity in healthcare for you. So I think, yes, the regulators are there, they have their regulations, we have to play by the rules, but I think if we could modulate and move this to more, where is value, like beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder, what is good care to a person who's at home with a really complex issue? How, how do we translate some of what CMS is looking at to be more consumer based. But I've chased all those metrics down. I've gotten all the data. I know what it's like to do that. This is a dream because I know it's slow, but it doesn't stop us from trying to move that. You know, as I collected all kinds of quality metric data, it often occurred to me is this making one bit of difference to this poor old lady in the home who's really suffering? And I think we have to start thinking more like that. I'm sure I have a lot of. Uh, agreement in the group who takes care of these kinds of patients. Absolutely. But to see, with every regulation, you have to really partner with larger healthcare groups as, such as Haney's, HIMSS, CHIME to drive these changes in Washington that you want to see. 
and you really have to have a coordinated approach to really make change happen. All right. So, Stephen, I'm going to be um, sensitive to your time. We got about two minutes Thank before you. the top of the hour. Um, would you like to make a closing statement um, before you move on, and then we'll continue on uh, and take up also questions from the uh, the audience. So, uh, any parting comments, words of wisdom for Stephen? Absolutely. Thank you, Nick, and thank you everyone for allowing me the opportunity to participate today. This uh, crisis pandemic has allowed us to really focus on what's important, and it has allowed us to focus more on the patient. And as consumerism was developing before COVID, it really creates a, an opportunity for us to change the way care is delivered. We have to have really dedicated effort to focus on what's important to the patient, how we're delivering the patient, what's important to the, to the patient that we're delivering the care, where, to, where it's needed by the patient. The technology is out there. They, you have to make a coordinated strategic decision. What technology will you adopt? What technology is right for your organization? What technology will work for your culture? I really focus on a holistic approach to the solution, not be reactive again. But this is a great opportunity for all of us to reimagine the way care is delivered to our patients. So with that, I am thankful again to be on the panel, and I wish you all the best. Have a good day. All right. Thank you. And thank you for participating, Steve. It was an absolute delight. Thank you again. Thank you, guys. So I'm going to slide into another area. We kind of touched upon it. Uh, it also became relevant probably in the third or fourth week uh, of the pandemic in New York City, and that was behavioral health. It's an area that like no one talks about. Uh, we talk about inventory care. We talk about the impact. We talk about all this stuff. but in the third or fourth week of, of the crisis, uh, they started providing call-in numbers for those that had been sequestered, quarantined, ill, uh, and the whole notion of the importance of behavioral health truly came to the forefront. Where does that fit in, in terms of where we are and what we need to do with our, our setting? Many times, uh, whether it be dealing with substance abuse, or depression, some of the ailments that we're, we're addressing are really caused by more deeper seated uh, 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 behavioral uh, drivers. That telehealth or, or any type of, of remote program could potentially address. So what do you think it fits in the whole scheme of things, especially uh, again with COVID and people being able to call in now saying, I need just to talk to somebody. What do you think? I think it's actually, you know, I think COVID has also brought this uh, to the forefront. And in terms of telehealth, it's a great opportunity, um, I think, for the behavioral uh, disciplines to really, um, you know, to really leverage. In in my experience, you know, when patients are coming back and forth to a facility for multiple um, appointments, whether it's treatment or physicians or uh, therapy, et cetera, those seem to be the appointments that tend to fall by the wayside. So those are the ones they don't want to come back to the brick and mortar for. And not only that, there's also, I think, physical space constraints, especially in, when you're operating in New York City, um, where those services often compete for the same physical um, footprint that, you know, some of the, the, the clinical programs are. And so. I think it's a great opportunity to leverage um, to leverage telehealth and these programs that we've seen the city and various states put out during COVID um, to really access at your fingertips to behavioral care. I think we have to, you know, let's not let those fade away. Um, I actually think we should capitalize on those. You know, of course, there's a reimbursement and a cost issue there um, that has to be addressed. But, but from a virtual perspective, and, and probably more so video than phone, I would think, would be, you know, more of the way to go, specifically for a counseling session. Um, hopefully, this makes it easier for patients to access more of that care um, in a setting that they're comfortable with, that doesn't require them to travel yet again to another appointment. Um, but I, I'm hopeful that, that, you know, 
that COVID has opened the door uh, for the behavioral health aspects of our industry to really come to the forefront. So all true. I, I just want to say that I think COVID was an overlay to the opioid epidemic. And in the opioid epidemic, that got us to begin to think about how do we make healthcare, mental health, behavioral health care, more available to people that weren't necessarily concentrated in our cities or that didn't want to go in and self-identify. Uh, maybe they were a mother with children and they were terrified to admit to something that, you know, they were depressed and then layer on it, on top of it now, the isolation, the anxiety, the depression that came with COVID, just being in your home. So I think um, the kind of the fires of innovation were starting to go with COVID. And again, a good friend, Dr. Aaron Ron, started a company called Caden Health with some alumni from Oscar. And they're an example, and I'm just throwing these companies out to, to give you real life examples that they exist. So they started a virtual behavioral health company where they do full assessments, they can actually go in, they can meet with you, they do, um, you know, they make themselves available so that if you are a mother or you're trying to hold down a job and you're trying to deal with these things, that it's more on your time when you can do it where you don't have to announce to the world. They also are working through local community organizations. I, I know of another organization that works with church groups and was training up uh, a lot of the, the church people to be kind of counselors so that they may provide the more trained professional group, but to work with people in the community who were very much trusted, that people feel they could come in and talk about things. So I think there is a very healthy movement for virtual behavioral health. I think, again, in my concept of you have general basic care, and then when it has to triage, to walk into a place and have structured therapy with somebody. But the more we loosen up cognitive behavioral health to comply with plans of care, to talk through the, the loneliness and isolation, it's not just COVID-based, which is anybody with complex illness homebound. I think it's starting to free up the imagination and these efforts are underway. I would love to see community-based groups like this really partner up strongly with the centers of excellence at brick and mortar places at facilities so there was a more seamless continuum of care because we have a lot of disruption points when somebody needs a higher level of care okay let me see who i can send you to and you know it's not as seamless as we could make it but it's very exciting what's out there. And I think what we're doing is cultivating a lot of grassroots movements to introduce people to care, to allow them to access it. And once they come in, it's the perfect opportunity for us to place them in the right level of care. Okay, this ties into a question that just came in and I'll paraphrase it. Um, but basically it talks about telehealth and obviously the current regulatory environment and, and reimbursement environment uh, is not overly conducive to this. And so what are healthcare organizations doing or what should they do uh, to really start advocating for all these changes? And, and so I'll give you as a product of the 60s and more mm -hmm. demonstrations that I want to think about. Um, and I think we see it in today's world, in today's news. If you want to make a change, you need to get to the grassroots level. You need to get to the folks that pay the, the co-payments and have the high deductible plans or dealing with you know weeks of waiting or, or what we'll say mediocre service. Uh, you need to get to those, those folks that then possibly vote for legislators that make changes in the regulatory environment that then makes changes into the, into the governmental structure that controls what we do in healthcare. Uh, so I'm, I'm very, very much a proponent of consumer-based uh, modeling because at the end of the day, uh, when you dive and, and have your hand in someone's pocket and you're taking out money from their pocket, you get their attention and they start getting actively involved. Uh, and if you're too sick to, 
there's someone in their surroundings that will get involved. Uh, I'll give a case in point. Many years ago, I ran a healthcare system that partnered with Walmart. And I actually met with the head of Walmart, went down to uh, Bentonville, uh, uh, Arkansas. And what they did is they uh, uh, took their employee health program and they turned it into a cash bonus program, gave the cash to every employee. And they said, purchase the health care that you see you think would be best for your situation, including the Walmart brand, which had a retail health component. They watched the utilization plummet. They watched, you know, what we'll say is uh, not necessarily frivolous, but not required pediatric visits drop. Um, they watched mothers take their children to the retail uh, offices. They saw their health care costs drop like a stone. Uh, I've worked with companies that the insurance uh, program sent, here's your telehealth card. And, you know, if you do a telehealth visit, it's a $5 copay or it's no copay uh, for it's these types of thing of, of uh, illnesses. The way you change this program is not by hoping and praying. The way you change this program is to really get to those that are paying for it, who will then vote for the folks that will make changes. That's how it works with everything else. So um, putting you both on the lawn, but what do you think? Because it, kind of, it sounds like the model is upside down. We're serving this regulatory environment that has lost touch with not only the, the caregiver, uh, but the care provider as well. What do you guys think? Yeah. I agree. I think, you know, I also think there is some onus on, on um, the organizations that have now really employed telehealth more widely to be tracking outcomes and to be really thinking uh, from the perspective of, you know, our patients getting, and we, and we have to look at this anyway, our patients getting the same or potentially better or, God forbid, worse care, um, you know, if care is being delivered on a telehealth platform. And not only, I mean, I think we should be looking, of course, at the clinical care, you know, delivery and the impact there, but then also, you know, what was the impact of the patient? How much money did we save them by not having to travel somewhere? How much time did we save them? How many more visits were attended because they could be done on a telehealth platform rather than coming to a brick and mortar? I feel like there's so many angles um, of the, you know, of the data that we probably need to look at. But I do think, um, you know, that big institutions and I'd say small practices alike really should be looking at and paying close attention to outcomes. I do worry that, you know, we launched into this so quickly, and granted, some organizations were further ahead than others. But by and large, as an industry, I think COVID really launched us into telemedicine and catapulted us, if you will. And I'm, I worry that I'm not sure how good a job we're doing because we're in the midst of a crisis really tracking outcomes and, and stepping back and, you know, looking at it from a bird's eye view. But I, I think that would be the onus on, um, you know, on the organization. Yeah, I think we're experiencing a paradigm change is, um, and where, where does change come from? It often comes on the periphery of the industry. What are the innovators doing there? Which is why I wanted to bring you glimpses of what people are really doing. So in order to fund things like this, it's really hard with the government, although there's a couple of innovation grants out there that are really interesting. But employers are a great source. Employers are willing to fund things that make sense. So you need a collaboration, the employer, the provider, the insurer, and many times the insurer is not a big part of it. If the employer has a self-funded insurance fund, they're willing to pay for stuff if it just makes sense. I mean, union benefit funds do that all the time for their workers. They'll authorize additional home care or this or that because it's good for their worker. So I think, you know, even looking at large institutions, and I see many of them are starting to do this now, is to dabble with the innovators, partner with them, learn about what they're doing. Many of them have innovation labs right now, but together it's very powerful. 
because if you can set up an employer funded Petri dish and come up with solutions that work, now you have the basis to go on and proselytize what you think is right for others. And people are buying this. People in the employers, I'm talking the large employers, multi-state employers, they're looking to do things differently. They are not satisfied with the status quo. So I know we t I tend to run to a Medicaid population. I'm a nurse at heart. But I think where the, the innovation could well be funded is not with the vulnerable populations. Maybe it comes from these more um, willing to experiment kind of populations. Okay, great. Well, I'm looking at the questions. I think we've hit all the questions that were presented. So uh, I'm going to propose that we wrap things up. And like we did with, with Steve, um, I'll ask Mary Ellen, do you want to give a wrap up statement on your side? And then Jennifer yourself, I'll do it. And then Tony, I'll turn it back over to you. So Mary Ellen. Okay. Well, I guess in reflecting on our conversation today, um, we're really poised. This is a moment of disruption. You know, health tech innovators talk about disrupting the industry. Well, COVID is a moment of disruption and it is throwing everything up in the air and it's causing us to question the assumptions we had, not just in clinical treatment, but in the industry, the systems. So my fervent hope is that we all become more aware of the innovation that's going on. We reach out and partner. We continue to have forums like this to learn more and what's out there. And we keep driving this innovation. We have to reduce cost. We have to improve meaningful quality. And we have to have a consumer oriented focus on what we do, what works for the consumer. And I think to many of us, that feels good. It feels right. It's what we've been trying to do. The constraints are institutions and funding. Where does that come from? All of these things we need to to work on. But there are some very interested tech giants out there that are looking to figure out how to be a part of healthcare. And healthcare has traditionally not opened itself up to some of these larger groups. I'm, I'm taking away the big giants of the healthcare industry, but there's a lot of mom and pop going on in healthcare. My prayer is, I think we're on the verge of innovation, this disruption, and I think it's very bright times ahead. A lot of good things to come. Thank you, Maria. Mm -hmm. Jen? Well, I'd like to thank uh, everyone from HLNY for affording me the opportunity to participate in this discussion. Um, like Mary Ellen and Stephen, and I'm sure all of our colleagues on the line, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful and excited for what the future holds uh, uh, for healthcare. And, and I completely agree that um, you know the onus is on us to make sure that these conversations don't stop, and that collaboration starts to happen uh, across organization lines, and I would say even across industry lines. Um, and uh, I look forward to hopefully partaking in some of these conversations in the future. And maybe next time we'll be able to be in person, <laughs> at least some of us anyway. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Well, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank you know Jennifer, Mary Ellen, and Stephen for taking what I'll say is an incredibly bold step of having an interactive dialogue uh, in front of uh, several hundred folks. Uh, and this was unrehearsed. We didn't have a bunch of questions that we rehearsed, and these were the answers. And and really, what you heard here was passion and commitment. I think that's what will make the difference in moving the healthcare model forward. So I want to thank all of you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Tony and Nick as well for providing the opportunity. And Tony, at this point, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate it very much. And yes, thank you uh, to uh, the great panel, great to our moderator, and to Nick Vilas from HLMY for working in collaborative mode with the New York State Chapter of Um If anybody is interested, once a month we will have similar type meetings like this. They're free to join. You're more than welcome to go out to the New York Hymns chapter and take a look at the schedule, which will be up shortly. Or you can contact me directly, and I'll be able to go over the schedule of events. Love to have you participate in all future events that come up. Uh, this will be recorded. The recording will be uh, saved online at both HLNY and at the New York Hymns chapter. So if anybody who missed part of it, all of it, or if you have associates who want to hear about it, uh, please go to our website, 
you'll be able to take the recording, download it, listen to it at your own leisure. Again, thanks to everybody. I think it was a great session and I appreciate everybody's time. I also want to thank the attendees for making the time and the effort to be with us today. Thank you. All right. Thank you.